thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, we're going to have a sort of a casual conversation about the state of journalism uh, in, in the country. Bill Densmore is going to help us get a sense of where things are right now. And then we're going to talk about um, the scene in Vermont and how each of our news outlets are, are doing right now. So, Bill, you want to take it away and talk about where we are? Sure. Thanks, Ann. I'm, I'm far from an expert, but I'll try to try to help, help us out a little bit. Um, my background uh, is uh, working for the Associated Press when I was younger, then trade publishing, then publishing weeklies in uh, the Berkshires, including The Advocate for a number of years, which uh, still circulates up here, although we don't own it anymore. Her company does. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I, the last several years, I've been very engaged in trying to understand the future and sustainability of journalism, both working with the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri, which is the, the oldest and one of the largest J schools in the country, and also at the, um, the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. I, to put kind of a, a kind of get a, a, a sort of national perspective, Ann and I just did some quick Google researching before we came up here tonight uh, to, to double check our recollection, which was right, that about 40,000 newspaper industry jobs were lost between the middle of 2007 and the end of 2011. Uh, that uh, it represented about 11% of the entire employment of the newspaper industry. Now, mind, the, mind you, I don't know off the top of my head the, the numbers for journalists. Obviously, a large amount of that is journalists. But the thing you need to realize is that there was a time when uh, the newspaper industry was the second largest industrial industry in the United States as a, as a unit, as a contiguous unit. So that's a tremendous uh, decline in one industry. Uh, and part of the reason for that is ad revenues of the collective U.S. newspaper industry are about half what they were a decade ago. They're around, they're around $35 billion a year now, and they were in the $60 billion range about 10 years ago. Another, another little way to put some perspective on that is to recognize that last year sometime, uh, the entire advertising revenue of the U.S. newspaper industry, that 35 billion and something number, uh, went below the advertising sold by Google alone by itself, one company. And of course, that was a, a, a world uh, that advertisers have, that is a world that advertisers play in today that didn't even exist for all practical purposes 10 or 15 years ago. Now in terms of what's happening to some of the newspaper companies that operate in Vermont, one of them is Digital First Media, which is the, op the uh, management company of Media News Group, which owns the Brattleboro Reformer and the Bennington Banner. Um, their uh, CEO just gave an interview a couple days ago in one of the uh, online services, John Payton, and uh, I think this, this, these numbers illustrate the challenge of moving from what he himself has called going from, uh, from uh, print dollars to digital dimes. They, uh, digital first media newspapers, uh, had about $900 million in revenues last year, and of that he said $165 million is digital, and by digital that would be uh, banner advertisements, uh, the upsell of classifieds onto the web, and uh, advertising in social, mobile, and video formats. And the, the uh, percentage of that 165, so that 165 million is 18% of their total revenues, uh, including print. And of that 165 million, 17% of it is coming from social, mobile, or video services, as opposed to uh, just pure web banner ads. So I just did the math here with my iPhone, and what that means is that the social mobile video advertising, that would be um, you know, uh, mostly what's on your phone or, 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 or in the ads that are inside videos, that's about 3% of this company's revenues. And that's probably a pretty good showing uh, for the newspaper industry generally. Uh, and at 18% and digital first media's revenues on the digital side are probably at the higher percentage end of most newspaper companies. So that helps you understand when you have a business that has half the ad revenue it had a decade ago and is only collecting 
about, uh, you know, and, and, and less than a fifth of its business is now digital when Google is now eating the newspaper industry's lunch. It gives you a sense of what the pressure is on, on figuring out how we're going to sustain journalism. Uh, as far as Gannett goes, which of course owns the uh, uh, Burlington Free Press, uh, Gannett just reported uh, their quarterly earnings report uh, yesterday, and uh, their ad revenues were down 5.3% quarter to quarter over the previous year, but their circulation revenues were up 11.4%. And that's an important number to look at too, because the reason it's up is because not only have newspapers been raising their, their uh, circulation, uh, print circulation rates, but many, many newspapers now in the United States are charging uh, for uh, access to content on the web. This was not true until just a few years ago. And so what it means is that the percentage mix of ad to uh, subscription revenue is gradually changing in the U.S. newspaper industry to be more like it has been historically worldwide, which is about 50-50. It used to be that newspapers got about 70% of their revenue from uh, advertising. And the New York Times, I think, is either either just did pass or is just on the verge of going past 50-50. So um, that gives you a sense of the tremendous challenge. Uh, and I don't think it's any different in Vermont. If, if anything, in Vermont, it's a little bit better because the worst pressure in, on the newspaper industry has been um, in the major metro papers. Now, I've said a lot about newspapers. Um, obviously, the, the sucking of advertising revenue uh, into digital, into the web and into digital services is also affecting greatly the, um, the uh, television industry. But uh, the real gigantic declines have not hit yet, but I think the industry is worried about it. So that's my quick report. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for putting yeah. it all in context because you know, all four of us are really working hard on the local level to provide Vermonters with news that they need to make decisions on a daily basis. And so we're going to be sort of talking about what we do individually to, to try to fill uh, various voids that have emerged over time. And um, so uh, I guess in general, I'm, I'm wondering, Michelle, if you could talk about the Bennington Banner and how things are going there, um, whether or not you've been able to maintain um, the quality and quantity of, of the news that you paper. And, uh, yes, thank you. Well, Bill talked a bit about the numbers, and yes, print revenue is on the decline for, for all um, newspaper companies, mine included, uh, which is Media News Group and, and Digital First Media. However, the digital revenue is on the upswing, and we expect, my company expects that it will cross over, or it will soon um, be making more money than the print side does. So this is the trend in print um, newspapers, like the Bennington Banner, like the Manchester Journal. We're not going away. We are changing. We're, we're rolling with the punches. Um, print isn't dead, but we, we now have a lot of other options for you, for the reader. Um, we offer e-editions, the electronic editions. We offer the website. You can look at the banner on an app on your iPad or your iPhone. So there are a lot of digital representations of the news that we offer as well. And being a part of a larger company like Digital First Media provides us with, with more opportunities for, for regional and national advertising, which can increase our revenue as well. So I hope that, that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I, I know having worked at the Rutland Herald and the Times Argus, I was the Sunday the editor there for about five years. And uh, it, it's very difficult, I think, to shift from print to the web because um, advertising on the web is not well developed. Um, there are many more competitors. Um, according to one source that I read, um, newspapers are really only able to get about 10% of the uh, advertising dollars they need on the web. So if you're not making money with that vehicle, it's hard to make the switch. You still need the print vehicle um, to make the money you need to keep your newsroom alive and to keep the rest of your employees on board. So that's really the challenge, figuring out how to make that transition because um, as, you, as you all probably know, it's very expensive to um, produce a print product. And in Vermont, 
the l even larger expense is actually distributing the thing, you know, trucking it around for, to little towns all over the state. So um, it is a difficult time, I think, for media companies. Um, at VT Digger, we're only online, and that's because um, we couldn't afford to try print in the beginning. And that gave us something of an advantage because we didn't have um, production people, we didn't have the sort of what they call legacy costs that come with um, a newspaper. And so in a way that gave us um, an advantage because we could simply devote all of our energies to um, the online product. We're also a nonprofit and about half of our money or a little bit more comes from readers and from business sponsors or underwriters and the rest we've been able to make through foundations and um, large donations. So that's also, it's a different business model that people are trying all over the country um, to, in order to make this transition and to provide um, a different kind of journalism that's focused on um, public service. We, it's not, in, in our case, we're just offering a niche product. It's state news. We do a lot of state house reporting we report on politics and public affairs. It's not the kind of thing that's going to generate a lot of eyeballs necessarily. We're not covering the Red Sox. We're not going to let you know about the latest murder down the street or a drug crime, things like that. Um, so it, it's a different kind of model. And uh, we're sort of similar to MinPost.com or Voice of San Diego. These smaller groups that are sort of modeled after ProPublica and Texas Tribune. Um, but enough about me. How about you, Tim? <laughs> well, let's talk about Ian for a second. And I'll, I'll do this like we're at social media, okay? So we're interactive. Um, what, is, what does this model sound like locally? Does anybody can make it something? A nonprofit um, raising a lot of their money through um, public entities. Yeah, the. <laughs> the Ron Public Radio, kind of, kind of the same thing a little bit. It is uh, without without the the broadcast piece, without That's that second true. piece, which is kind of kind of important to um, um, what we're all doing. In the 1990s, I can't remember which year it was. The New York Times uh, bought the Boston Globe for over a billion dollars, and um, now the Globe is valued at 35 million dollars or so. It, and who knows who knows why. <laughs> why? Why is it worth even that much? Losing money. They own a lot of property around Boston. Boston has very valuable real estate. So it's only it, the only value to the Boston Globe now is because they have this legacy property value. If anything, they have huge liability because they have pensions to pay out and for some years to come. And the union contracts and all that, all that, all right. that sort of thing. Um, as far as the. Um, uh, print newspapers are concerned, um, in, in a company I'm very familiar with, they have about 10 employees, uh, all age ranges, 20s, 30s, all the way up to 65, and one person reads the Burlington Free Press. Exactly one person. So this is not a, I think people overblow this, you know, kids, they're all at their apps and stuff like that. I think this is complete blown away all the demographics that we're familiar with and all the stereotypes of demographics we're, we're familiar with, that this is something experienced by, by all people everywhere, and all media everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what, one of the great losses, I think, that's going to happen in um, uh, newspapers is, is the loss of the Associated Press. I'm going to talk about uh, that a little bit and, and how we're working with, uh, with Vermont Digger. Uh, I bring up the Boston Globe because um, what they, what, of course, with the internet and just generally lo uh, loss of uh, newspaper readers, um, their circulation was going down, their ad revenues were doing, going down. And I'll burden you with one more question. What really tanked their company? Boston.com. Boston.com, thank you. Where did that come from? Where did that answer come from? And you think, well, how did that happen? You know, how did, oh, this is the new, this is a new thing. This is their internet, they're making money, and they, they, it, they get a tremendous um, number of readers for Boston.com. Well, uh, I don't know, but you, you, if, if you think about it, you have the Boston Globe, the New York Times, the smartest people in the room, and they got it completely wrong. And so that, that really scares the dickens off of the rest of us because, mm -hmm. well, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to figure it out? Um, I guess that's what we're here for is to figure it out. Um, 
the, our revenues are still very high in the, the print area. We don't have a lot of employees. We don't have a printing press. When I worked at the Brattleboro Reformer, um, the sister paper of the banner, um, back in the late 80s, we broke 10,000 subscribers. And we thought, oh, man, we're, we're awesome. We're the, the cat's meow here. Uh, that was, as you can imagine, the top of the mound has been, been downhill from there. Um, Vermont Business Magazine um, struggled. The old owner had to sell it out of uh, bankruptcy. Um, I was there, I made the transition, and now I, I own half of it, which scares, scares me to no end, I'll tell you that. But we still have a, a print publication. In fact, I have, because you came all here, I have free subscription forms, so, so please take those <laughs> with you and get, email to get our, our e-news. And so, um, of course, we set up a website, and it's very rudimentary um, a dozen years ago or so, and then we initiated um, uh, an e-newsletter, a daily newsletter. Anybody get, get the, oh, excellent, good. Um, and that was a, sort of a picking the, the low-hanging fruit. We were really the, the first ones of, of, any, of any media to do that. And one of the reasons we did that, and uh, the Free Press did, and the other new daily newspapers did, and uh, the um, television stations did, not uh, seven days up in Burlington, the Alternative Weekly, if, that's, if there's anything, such a thing as an alternative newspaper anymore. And we're all kind of alternative. <laughs> is that we weren't slitting our own throats. The, the dailies, the TV stations, they were all scared of doing that because why would anybody read the newspaper or, or wait around until the 6 o'clock news comes on or the 11 o'clock news? They're going to go to bed at 9.30, right? Uh, why would they do that? The news is already presented to them. And so they still haven't, they still haven't figured that out. Uh, seven Days uh, does it. Uh, Ann does, I think, just, just the weekly. Is it? Just the weekly we have a daily newsletter, but it's all our own stuff. We don't we don't aggregate. So we thought we were doing great. You know, this newsletter we were first on the block. People liked it. Um, and then another thing happened in that uh, our friends at the newspapers decided they were going to put up paywalls. And uh, the Bo uh, Boston got dot com did the same thing. Some of them, and they're they're all different because nobody knows what to do, right? So we're all kind of guessing, trying to figure it out. So initially what we were doing is we were grabbing stories um, from all over Vermont, and we are keeping it strictly Vermont, we were uh, scraping news stories, and, and uh, um, our colleagues in the other newspapers loved that because we were driving readers to their sites. We were making money, they were getting readers. Everyone was happy, well, it was kind of chicken feed considering the overhead, the newspapers, and um, you know, WCAX, they have wall-to-wall -wall news now. I'm not sure if you ever watch WCX News, but what do they start at 5.30 in the morning? It's almost continuous, it seems, throughout the day that they have a news program going. Uh, very, very expensive. A lot of overhead. Uh, so all of a sudden, our business model had to, had to change quite dramatically. So we started producing a lot more contact, content. We work with um, uh, VT Digger, thank goodness. They're there. They, they have, by the way, a tremendous reputation in Montpelier. Even though the Burlington Free Press does a great job of covering Mont Montpelier as well, and the Press Bureau uh, for the Times Argus and the Rutland Herald does a great job, they are they are now trapped behind their own their own paywall. So only their subscribers, and you get you can get a little content from them, um, but not much. But the model that uh, uh, Ian Galloway has come up with, and uh, Vermont Public Radio, and the, the broadcast television stations are, is that they need that interaction on their website. They can't, I, I don't see the business model being able to be blocked that off because that's what they're, what, what they're going to do. And so it's good for me because now, now I, have, I have content, we have our own content, we're producing more uh, ourselves. Now the, what we're all kind of grabbing though is not a slice of the pie, it's almost like molecules of the pie. <laughs> because the other thing that's changed besides the, the sort of nuts and bolts we've been talking about is now everyone is self-selecting their news. You know, it used to be you'd wait until 6 o'clock to get the, the TV news. Uh, the network news would come on at 6.30. Remember the, remember the whole thing, or, or 7 when they extended the, the local news to an hour. Um, uh, the radio station the radio station used to cover a lot of news, as we know, and you could, you could catch them. Uh, the newspaper would come in the morning and the afternoon. For some reason, my parents had both the, the AM and the PM newspapers. I don't know why, because we didn't read all. We, we accumulated a lot of newsprint for the fireplace. And so the news would come to you and you had no choice. Now you can go anywhere. So now we have to be, have, have some sort of niche 
that people want to come to us. There's some reason for them to want to come to us because they can go to Google, which has Monopoly, and I have no idea why they haven't been broken up yet. You know, if they were an oil company, you know, Congress would have, you know, had their head a long time ago. For, for some reason, that hasn't happened. I'm not sure why. Um, so everyone is self-selecting their news. So how do how do we tap into that? And then and um, Again, ho hopefully we'll, we'll figure some of that out tonight because it, is, it isn't obvious to me uh, where that's going to go. It, it's constantly changing. That's a big part of the problem. We, I think of the RSS feeds and um, Facebook and Twitter and email. These are sort of the newspaper boys of the 21st century. Um, but we never know necessarily what people are going to grab onto and what they're not. And we don't report based on what we think people will want. Um, but it is kind of astounding when the decrim bill story gets 10,000 hits in an hour. I mean, that's, I guess, you know, people like to smoke pot, so it's popular. Um, we had a story about um, Vermont being the first state to ban fracking last year, and we had 50,000 people on the site in one day. But that's not what we, what we depend on. We depend on people coming back every day. We have an avid readership that they're, they're sort of obsessed with us, and, and we like that. Um, and, uh, but really reaching outside that base group is difficult because the logarithms are always changing with Google, um, and you never know what people are going to pick up um, on social media. And we really work the social media. You know, you have to have someone posting this stuff, it, coming up with clever extra little headlines and so on. So. Um, it, it's a, a great deal of work. I mean, I think it's worthwhile, but it, it does make you wonder, you know, how it's all going to evolve. And I think that we just have to be in a position to, to adapt all the time. Otherwise, we're, we'll be in trouble. But I think the, 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 the given, though, is that we know that readers need information and will come to us if, they, if, if they're looking for it. So, you know, we, we are able to tap into that, but, but um, the ground is sort of shifting under us as we, as we work. Tom, I want to go back to something you said a few minutes ago and see if, I can, if I'm clear about what you meant. You said that it's a source of consternation for all of us in the industry that people like the New York Times and the Globe didn't get it right. And you said, what was their big problem? And, and you said, Boston.com. Were you, were you saying that what the problem was was that they were competing with themselves? Was that yes. the point you wanted to make? Well, that's the point I wanted to make. Yeah. Well, and, and what they're doing, too, is that they have um, they're not only completing it with themselves, they're not doing it very well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very popular site, but it's more of a, uh, you've probably all, all been at boston.com, you know, they give you just sort of snippets, they give you different, they give little videos, but they also have uh, bostonglobe.com, which right. is the online mm -hmm. print issue. So they're, they're trying to do three different things, it seems to me, mm -hmm. and not only are they competing with themselves and slicing their own throat, like I said, um, they're not really doing that great a job with it. And I, I, don't under, I don't understand um, um, why you wouldn't do that because why be so superficial uh, online? Mm -hmm. what, what we do is we put, we'll put enormous tables on there and you know, a, a, a Green Mountain Power will come out with a, um, a, an annual report. Actually, Green Mountain Copyrights would be a better example because they give you copious financial in information because they're a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. And we'll give you tables and tables of stuff. And if you want to read that stuff, you can. But if you don't, you have the teaser there, you can just read that. So I'm not sure why Boston.com, but clearly that product, not only is the, the sort of the grander product of what they were doing, they got wrong, but even if they were only doing Boston.com, they've gotten it wrong, but, I think. But I think the theory was that people would only read snippets, that they would have no interest in reading long form online because of the studies that came out early on. So that's what they went for, right? They were just going for the eyeballs. But we know that people do like reading longer stories online because we publish them all the time. Well, what's, um, what's interesting, I think, about what the Globe has done is they've segmented the, uh, the market in two mm -hmm. pieces. Yeah, uh, they have. They have the Boston.com, which is just little snippets. It's sort of the broadcast, the equivalent broadcast on the web. And then, then they have BostonGlobe.com, which is, uh, doesn't have a lot of advertising is a charge site. You can only get two or three clicks on it before you have to pay for it, uh, which is uh, an upsell to their print subscribers, and which is very, you know, it's beautifully, it's beautifully laid out, uh, and it's it has the full length of all the stories. 
Um, I find myself, um, I, I actually took a, a digital subscription to the Globe, even though we live in Williamstown, because I found I too often was wanting to read the whole story. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it isn't that much money. I think it's $20 a month uh, or $15 a month. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I think that in the industry, the Globe is looked at as having got it right in the last few years. Originally, they were out there in a big way promoting everything, putting everything on the web and having mm -hmm. it all be free, and they've pulled back from that. Um, the Times, there's almost a religious argument about whether what the New York Times is doing is a success or a failure. There's as many people saying it's a failure as saying it's a success. I think those who believe that journalism that journalism that matters, the public service journalism of the sort that, that I, I, I think all of you try to do, that that's important to uh, democracy and that it's important that it be more or less available to everybody. The, the challenge with that is how do you pay for it? Well, the way public radio has solved that problem is to do endless fundraisers and uh, and I don't, I don't think they're endless. I think they just seem endless. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> judgment call. I'll take out the word endless by doing fundraisers. But, and what that means is that the 5 or 8% of the listeners who pay are subsidizing the free ride of everybody else, which I guess is okay, uh, as long as those 5 or 8% are willing to do that. Um, but I think that the challenge we have to get to is some way to encourage the audience to make it easier easier for the audiences to pay for information that has value to them in their lives without somehow making it an audience of only the elite, which is, I think, your, the concern you observe regarding the Rutland Herald. I have to uh, uh, acknowledge a conflict of interest. Um, I started a company in 1994 called ClickShare Service Corp which provides user authentication, registration, site access control, and billing for newspaper websites, including the Rutland Herald. So I'm, I'm, I can't speak without bias about paywalls. I mean, I think that, uh, but I would never have wished that we would ever started calling it paywall. I mean, I think what, uh, it would be as if you would say, gee, I went to the supermarket today, but before I left, I had to go through the paywall. Uh, it's just merely a way to ask people to exchange value for something that has value, um, just like you do when you go to any store and pay, or when you subscribe to any magazine. But I, I do think that this that the sort of hard paywall is is a difficult business challenge, and I do think that even if all content were paid for on the web, we still have to have some sort of a sort of library pass solution for people who can't afford to get the news because. We can't have a, uh, I mean, the, the, re the reason why newspapers were subsidized with super low mail rates by the founding fathers was because they realized that journalism was an important public good and that it was important for everybody to have access to it. And w as long as newspapers were relatively cheap, 10, 15, 20 cents a day, uh, most people, certainly everybody except the most destitute could afford to buy a newspaper. Um, and hopefully, we'll get to a payment system or systems on the web where there are tiers of access where even if you don't have a lot of money, you can at least afford to get basic critical news. Or that there's some way for you to get it for free by going to a library. Well, that's not happening now. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, we're not there no, yet. I we're in this transition period. Really. I mean. the, well, the example I was using of, of the company where only one person read the newspaper, regardless of the demographic, was that uh, the newspaper was free to everybody, but they still weren't reading it. Right. So, um, and I don't think they're they're interested in reading it. I think they they want the news they want to get. They want it in a, a certain voice, and um, they're fine with that. And mm -hmm. you know, it's hard. To, it, I I mean, I, I could I could moralize here about um, how they're not getting, you know, what, one, of the, one of the things that, that happened in newspapers historically is, is they became objective because they had to, um, to be able to be um, legitimate in the reader's eyes. Well, people don't seem to, to care about that so much anymore. They, they, they sort of project the legitimacy of what they're reading because they're interested in reading it or mm -hmm. listening to it or watching it. I don't know if that's strictly true. I just said it's true. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, I, I'm just saying it's, it's <laughs> but in my, my observation is that yeah. people are seeking out what they want to seek out and then they're, they're happy with the, what they find. I mean, we've, we've grown to, uh, from nothing to um, 85,000 unique readers a month and, you know, I, I'm floored at how many people want to read geeky government stories and I think that's because people want fact-driven material like you produce, like I produce, like you produce, Michelle. And they want, they, 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 they want the information, and I don't think they necessarily want the opinion. Maybe young people do, but I don't think that's necessarily true. We have a lot of followers on Twitter who are 20-somethings. Yeah. Some people just want the straight stuff. What, it, what have you found about your readers? Are they as interactive as, as they used to be? Used to get, at the oh, yeah. Reformer used to get a ton of letters to the editor. Is that, is that type of stuff still happening? I would say our readers um, are very prone to comment on online, on Facebook, on Twitter. They want to be heard. Um, and I just want to make, clarify that the banner has a paywall. And so if you were not a subscriber, you would be allowed to see five, five articles in a month, and then you would be asked to pay after that. Um, the paywall was a new new to me. I've, I've been at the banner six months. Before that, I was at a paper in, in Pennsylvania for more than 12 years that did not have a paywall. And I thought, how could this paper possibly make any money? How could they stay in this paywall? It was an experiment that proved to be profitable, and mm -hmm. it's not going away. <laughs> Um, I mean, they're, they're talking about different ways to offer products to readers. Um, they call it all access. They don't like the term paywall. Yeah. Um, so that you can buy a print subscription, but also get, you know, online access at the same time for a certain amount of time for a low, low price. So the paywall isn't as much of a, a burden as I would have expected at all. It's actually quite a success. And, in my experience with the banner. You know, Anne, we were talking before the panel started and you were saying that um, that you, that part of your business model is asking, uh, to, is syndicating your content and asking yeah. people to pay for it. So in a sense, in, you know, if you want to be elastic about the term, that's a form of paywall <laughs> in the sense that, mm -hmm. that you are saying, well, you can't have, you can't resell our content without paying us for it. Mm -hmm. um, and I would think, I'd be surprised if you weren't thinking about ways to product differentiate the way the Globe did with some of the super geeky stuff that's mm -hmm. only of interest to a particular industry segment we, or something. We are, we are thinking about yeah. that. We're actually thinking about putting together a bill tracking system during the legislative session just for um, people who are in the State House every day, want to know every detail and then offering um, that as a newsletter subscription service for a four month period. That would not change the fact that we would still be producing the same number of stories we do now. We'd hire someone just to do that. But we also have um, access to um, some software that will enable us to take information that comes off the legislative website and augment it. We're also working on a campaign finance database that Great. will go back to 2009 and it will track donations to candidates. It tracks contributors. We're also hoping to link up the general contract database and the um, lobbyist disclosure database that, the, um, that, that uh, we're going to make available. So we actually have to sort of marry all this data together. Um, but you'll be able to click on um, a large donor, say, Tony Pomerlo, um, and you'll be able to see that his brother, Ernie, has some businesses and those businesses have donated to a given candidate, and you'll be able to lump the whole thing together. So you'll be able to see any donation that the Pomerleau family or the Pomerleau companies have given to any given candidate in the state. That's House reps, Senate, Senate candidates, and statewide candidates. And you know, we may offer this actually as part of a subscription package to news organizations and tailor it for each county. So we might go to Michelle and say, gee, you know, we have a lot of information about Dick Sears and Bob Hartwell, two of your senators. Would you like this? You know, we can give you this data to put on your website. It's actually to our advantage that the local organizations are behind a paywall because what that means is that there's no competition between the two news organizations. We can um, sell the content to local news organizations for very little money. We make a little bit 
readers get to know who we are because we ask um, the Caledonian Record and the Vermont Business Magazine and um, uh, the Valley News and WDEV to you know, give us credit. Um, so it enables us to reach a local market and at the same time make a little money and hopefully provide more information for, for readers in those regions. So that's kind of what we're working toward. We'd like to go statewide with that kind of distribution service. It, it takes some time, um, but, but that's what we're hoping to do. But it's not really a paywall because um, we still offer all that information for free on our site. We may put the um, bill tracking service behind a paywall. I don't know yet, but that would be just for people who are really into the legislature. Not everybody wants to know every, you know, little, you know, daily change in a bill. So um, certainly lobbyists and lawmakers do, but average Vermonters probably don't care. <laughs> they just want to know, you know, where where things are along the way and when there are big changes made. So. Peter yeah. Shumlin's latest land deal or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. That, that would something go on the website. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's in, right. In our archives, Vermont Business Magazine, because it, we've been around uh, since 1972, uh, we, we just switched to a bigger server. And when we switched it over, they told me we had a million stories. Oh, my God. In our archive. Wow. That's incredible. And, and we. And some of those are like press releases and stuff like that. So sure. it's not like, you know, Tim McQuiston wrote a, has written a million stories in the last 40 <laughs> years. Um, just feels like that. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but we haven't been able to monetize that. And it's been, it's been hard to get that out there. And this is actually one of the problems that Boston Globe ran into as well, is they had all this content and they thought, oh, we can just, People just love going in our archives, but they haven't been able to sell it. And I, you know, it's it's right there, but we haven't been able to to sell it. These stories are available. Uh, you can you can find you can search on our site. So the the business magazine online is behind a paywall, and what you see at Vermont Business uh, VermontBusiness.com is is all is all free, similar to what um, uh, Ann has at BT Digger. Uh, and there's two different entities, but we haven't been able to capture what would seem to be a gold mine, but it, we haven't been able to get any, you know, you know, who, who would read that? I mean, it'd be interesting, if I put all that stuff up there free, you might run into it and go, oh, gee, you know what, Peter Shumlin, you know, 25 years ago, um, wasn't elected to his first um, position as a, as a state rep, he was appointed by Madeline Cunin, who told him not to say anything. <laughs> that must have been hard. And well, it's remarkable because the first time I met him, he just, you know, the stuff just came out. He's like, this guy is a gift for gab. Um, he had been, a, he, always, he, was, he was a local guy there in, in Putney. He grew up there and his family had this, this business and the farm and we know the story very well. Um, but that's how he got, and he'd, he'd read the story and go, oh, that's really interesting, but no one wants to pay for it, you know, no one wants to search for it. But this is another issue. I mean, if you search for certain stories online, Irene, for example, if you're looking for stories about Tropical Storm Irene from two years ago, it's very difficult to find news stories now because they're all behind a paywall. You know, if you're just Googling and looking for information, we come up because we're free. Seven Days comes up. But I, I actually think it's kind of a shame to put archive material behind a paywall for that reason. You kind of want people to have an excuse to find you. And ultimately, any kind of paywall situation, I think, hurts um, advertising in the long run. But you know, if, if you're making money, Michelle, doing that, God bless you. I mean, I, you got to do what you can. I want to, I want, so. It wasn't my idea. <laughs> <laughs> I want to conduct a little experiment here. I want you to all, all of us to think back 30 years and tell me, see if you can just think for a minute about how much you were spending a month on information services. That would be your, well, your telephone, your newspaper, and I don't know what else. So just think about that for a minute and then tell me, do you think it was more than uh, $50 a month? Raise your hand if you think it was more than $50 a month. Okay. Now, uh, think about now, think about your cell phone, your internet access, uh, your digital online subscriptions, your telephone line, uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, count Netflix if you subscribe to Netflix. Um, would you say it's uh, 
closer to $100? Raise your hand. <laughs> more than $100. It's way more than that. Okay. So $100, $150. So, I mean, now I said 30 years, and there's been a lot of inflation <laughs> in 30 years, but I guess the point I wanted to make is that I think as a percentage of our income, we all spend more on information than we did 30 years ago because information is more abundant. Um, so the, the other question I want to ask is, I think the key problem with the quote paywall uh, solution is that it tends mm -hmm. to silo everything. In other mm -hmm. words, it does. if I want to subscribe to the Bennington Banner, I have to subscribe with you. If I want to subscribe to the uh, the uh, Burlington Free Press, that's a subscription through the Gannett system. If I want to subscribe to the Rutland Herald or the Montpelier paper, I have to subscribe through another system. Um, one of the things that, that I was working on in the 90s and I'm still sort of a, a tireless promoter for is the idea of uh, a sort of fast pass for information that would work across the web. And so I guess what I would ask is, how much would be, how much do you think an average person would pay a month to get not unlimited, but sort of significant amount of access to all their information, all their, their news information needs? So that it wouldn't matter whether you were clicking there or clicking to the whatever you decide, whatever little stuff you decide to put behind a paywall. It wouldn't matter if I'm clicking to Brattleboro or Bennington or Rutland or to Burlington that it would all be the same subscription, or at least it would be a single single bill. How much would that number be in, in light of everything else we're paying on information? Would it be, would that, would that be worth $10 a month, $20 a month? Let me just see a show of hands. Would it be worth $10 a month? Raise your hand. Okay, $20 a month? More than that. That's, that's good news for journalism. <laughs> that to me, that answers for me, the question that you asked among the questions you typed up before mm -hmm. we got together, which was, how are we going to support journalism? There's a, there's a system that's waiting to be scaled, I think, that might start to support journalism. The problem now is that the only person that has a system like that is Google for advertising, mm. and Google isn't hiring any journalists. By the way, <laughs> while we've been sitting here, I, was, I noticed I did have one piece of paper which mentioned that uh, in a four-year period through 2011, 13,400 newspaper journalists lost their jobs. So mm -hmm. that's the journalism number. Um, so imagine if Google were employing 13,000 journalists right now, how much more reporting we'd have in this country. That's, I think, an interesting thing to think about. But they're not, because that's not their business model. You know, one of the things that I was at, at intended to talk about is uh, the future of print and whether was, there was a future of print. Yeah. And, um, well, I sure hope so because it's, it's, our, our print revenues are, are much higher. We still have uh, a very robust paid subscription. Um, and so you'll get a, a free subscription to the print issue. And then in a year, the idea is that maybe you'll pay for it. Maybe you'll see the value in it. Uh, that, that's one of the strategies, you know, the marketing strategy, right? Um, but still, it's, it's, it's um, pretty significant as far as our total revenue is concerned. And the print advertising is still about 90% of uh, the total revenues. So it's still very important. And when the, the Burlington Free Press, anybody get the Free Press? As you know, they went through a, they decided to be seven days. They decided to be an alternative weekly that came out every day. <laughs> and um, so their, their first issue, they made a big deal of it. The first issue came out. And uh, if you're familiar with seven days, it's like this, ah! right? <clears throat> uh, and their website even more so. So the Free Press comes out and they have a great story, a cover story. They've changed it to, a, it's, it's a tabloid now. And um, a great story by Candy Page on um, wind energy and, and you know the, all the issues with wind energy. We, we love it, we hate it. It produces a tremendous amount of energy at a relatively low cost, especially when you consider renewables. We worked up this whole story, they had it ready to go, and what happens, Ian Galloway did the story first. <laughs> and that, that's, and then it got reprinted in, in Vermont Business Magazine and on vermontbusiness.com. So by the time this, this lovely story came out, it was like, oh, oh yeah, it's a nice story. And that's the dilemma that, that all of us doing print have, is that um, 
were confined into a, a time space. Now, the, the free press has kind of changed. They've kind of gone back to like an old, more of an old-fashioned uh, tabloid newspaper. And it actually seems to be working. When they first came out, they had no agate, uh, no box scores for the baseball games and things like that. And I was like, eh. And go try and find that online. Oh, they'll, they'll find it online. Oh, you know, it takes forever to find that stuff online. It's a, it's a mess trying to find that stuff online. And it takes an enormous amount of time. And even when you find it, it takes, you know, you're scrolling through. It's, it's very, very inefficient. Uh, print is much more an efficient read. Um, you can throw it around. My son got um, one of those Nook things, one of those reader tablet things, and he doesn't use it anymore because it broke. You know, all right, there's 135,000, 135 dollars down. <laughs> <clears throat> That's a lot of newspapers. Um, so they have gone back, and one of the one of the, the things besides the fact that the newspaper is easier to read, you can read the kitchen and all this kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about it. You can burn it later in the fireplace. Um, is that it's a delivery system. And you get the, the Brunton Free Press on a Thursday, and it is just stuffed with flyers. Now, if you're, uh, if you're J.C. Penney or you're the local camera guy, how else are you going to deliver that? So with the daily newspaper, do you do, you do tons of flyers? Do you have like a, the flyer day? Saturday. Saturday um, is the flyer day. Where else, where else are they going to distribute that? So there's, there's still a, a big market for print. The USPS. Well, think of the expense of that. <laughs> Don't you get junk mail? I, I get very little junk mail. Okay. Well, I get all my junk mail in the daily newspaper. That's my point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually no, you're kidding about that. And the free press, it comes twice. It comes on Thursday and it comes on Sunday. So that, you know, what, what is going to happen to print? Well, uh, you know, the, the people value the print a lot more. As you, as you know, the online advertising is becoming like um, um, wheat. It's becoming a commodity. You know, the, the value, the cost per thousand, and the cost per million keeps going down and down and down. And then, but it, because the, the, um, the entire universe is growing, the revenues are still there. But the value in print is, is, is held up much better. So um, well, you know, is, is, there, is there a future print? I think, I think but, and I wish I could see where we're was actually be very helpful to me well young people don't like to get ink on their fingers that's what I've read okay <laughs> where'd you read it <laughs> no it's, it's uh, young people like to use their phones and they like to use iPads they're digital natives I mean that's the thing anybody I mean Michelle's in that group the rest of us we're not we're actually I'm in the, in the <laughs> print paper group I like, to, I like to hold the newspaper. But I mean, we're, but I we're, we're all phone. trying to bridge a kind of digital divide. There are people who are under the age of 40 who really only want to deal with stuff online. And, and people our age who have nostalgia about print and are used to it. And I mean, the thing about the web is it's so cool. You can watch a video clip. You can um, download documents. You can link to other sites. You can. Um, I mean, you can explore in a way that you can't do with a newspaper. I, I so I think we just have to find a way to make it more useful for people. So the Burlington Free Press should have agate on the web. Um, and they don't. And I'm, they I'm don't. Not, I'm not sure why they don't. Yeah. I think. I, I mean, it's I really know. about making it useful for people so they can curate that, just maybe, like maybe we all aggregate news. You yeah, know, maybe they don't feel like they care about the box scores. Are, are people old enough to care right. about? Well, the box that could score. be too, right? How come you don't do video? You used to do a lot of video. We do some video now. We, we were really focused just on getting the, the, the daily out for a while, and um, we were disorganized with video, but now we're doing it again. Okay. I started out doing nothing but videotaping, and Tim often would be at the same events with the same kind of camera, <laughs> basically listening to politicians, and it is useful. But our, our video is like C-SPAN, you know, it's not very interesting, and I got a lot of sort of negative comments about it, so. We don't, we don't have a CAX style operation where people are creating B-roll and, you know, narrative and all that stuff. So now we're getting back to it. But. And their online news really, is, is, CAX's online news is really, really superficial. It's, it is, it's, yeah. it's just about 50 words. You guys do video online? We do. Um, we do the, the traditional um, edited video, um, but we also have started something new. We're uh, 
Digital First Media is partnered with a company called Tout that has an app that takes video. Um, for most people, it's 15 second video, but if you're a pro, if you sign up as a journalist um, for a Tout account, you can take 45 second videos. They're very easy to take. Um, you can send it right out to Twitter and Facebook. You can embed it directly in a story. Very easy to do. We have a new widget on our web page. This is an advertisement. Um, but, so do it's, you do it like an iPhone? You're just taking an iPhone? Take it on your iPhone or your iPad or Android phone. Mm -hmm. So it's real easy to do. I think that um, when I was a reporter, the problem with video is it took so long to edit and they kept changing the processes and they kept changing the cameras or the ways that we'd do it and it was very time consuming. Now you can do it in under a minute, you can post it, you know, it can go worldwide in, in a minute. Which is dangerous, yes, but it's possible. Do you guys like the video on the, the webs and the newspapers? Yeah, I think everybody likes it, yeah. I think we have a question. We have a question. John. That's right. And I read the uh, journal every day, you know, get it delivered. Yep. Uh, and it's funny that uh, it doesn't seem like it's something any smaller. <laughs> uh, you know, the number of sections and so forth. I can also get it it's on, a great the, paper. Uh, on the internet or on the web. But you have to pay for that, right? They were yeah, one of the first to put a paywall up. It's pretty pricey material. So it is. This, uh, uh, how are they faring in all of this? You mentioned the time. Yeah, it's a good question. I was going to actually uh, mention them, and I, I was going to um, set them aside because they occupy such a unique place, and they have occupied such a unique place in in journalism. Mm -hmm. um, from also a journalism journalistic point of view, and it's a, it's a tremendous newspaper, as uh, Anne was mentioning. Um, except they get the uh, editorial page, and it's written in crayon. I don't know why they why they do that, but. Um, <clears throat> But they do a great job of the news. Their, their business model is, is really, really good. In fact, when Murdoch bought it, he wanted to open it up, make it free, and they told him, no, don't do that, and he listened to them. Um, and I think it's just because what they do is, is so different from, uh, maybe it isn't so different than what the rest of us do, but what, what my perception is what they do is so different, and they occupy such a unique place in the, the world of journalism that um, it's, I, I can't see how to, how to translate that. But, but there are competitors in that market, Reuters and Bloomberg, and they're all behind paywalls, right? Well, Bloomberg does a great mm. job, too. They, right, so, sort of, but I mean it. But it's a daily newspaper. Mm -hmm. It's a print, daily print newspaper that also has a strong online Why press. Why is it so different than everything else? Well, the theory, we're, we're, we're talking for the, for the camera that men have heard the question, we're talking about the Wall Street Journal and how it differs or doesn't differ from U.S. journalism, U.S. news organizations generally. The, I think the conventional wisdom is that the Wall Street Journal, because it produces a service that people make money with, that people write off their subscription to the Wall Street Journal as a business expense. So it's much easier for them to sustain a subscription than it is for someone subscribing to a general circulation newspaper. I. I I don't have the number in my head for the Wall Street Journal for its subscribers, but I can tell you that the New York Times has just passed 600,000 online subscribers, mm. which is quite an achievement because the it paper is. itself is only uh, something uh, short of 800,000 print circulation. Mm. And the typical newspaper, uh, at least until recently, was lucky if it got 5% or so of its print subscription as a digital subscriber other than the upsells, in other words, other than, other than you getting it automatically because right. you're a print subscriber. You know, I wonder if we should um, ask people in the audience if they've got questions. And I'm, I'm also curious to have you talk to us a little bit about um, what, how your experience of journalism has changed uh, over, over the last 10 or 15 years and what you think should be done about it. Yeah. And the, the person behind the camera suggested we repeat your questions since you aren't mic'd. So that's what we'll do. No, go ahead. My question is much more basic. In the room right now are at least three generations of journalists. There's mine. I graduated school of journalism in 1949.
right. Where is that at? Where is that? Penn State. Penn State. Mm -hmm. So the questioner, just to uh, just to repeat for the camera. Yeah. Even in the schools today, how much is print and how much is everything else? What percentage of graduates will come out will be interested in a career in print? I mean, this is the battlefield where the future comes from. So your question is. What is changing in terms of the job prospects and the teaching in U.S. journalism schools? Right. Okay. Can I try that? Because I have, you're I an know, academic. Yeah, I know quite a bit about uh, Missouri and University of Rhode Island. Uh, frankly, nobody enters journalism school anymore expecting to get a job in print, because print as an ex as a medium by itself doesn't exist anymore. What you do in Bennington is not print anymore. It's print. It's uh, it's video, it's uh, tweeting, it's, if you name it, she has to know how to do it. And the journalism schools have gotten that message loud and clear, and so for most of them have what are called convergence tracks, where you're taught all these different media. And I guess I would say also that my, my counsel to people running news organizations now is don't think of yourself as being in a production business where you're producing a product. Think of yourself as being in a service business where you're meeting people's information needs by any means necessary. So I think, does that answer your question? Yeah, well, it only indicates to me that print, per se, has a limited future. Well, there's a... More... Print is becoming progressively smaller and smaller, yeah. But I think what's more troubling is the trend in which you do see journalism schools becoming straight communications programs, and more and more of the graduates are not journalism majors, they're PR majors or communications majors. And you know what I observe working at the State House is that, um, and you see this too as an editor, you know, we get reams of press releases and um, you know queries for stories from people who are PR professionals and it seems like they outnumber us 10 to 1 and um, I think that is a scary prospect for our democracy because it seems to me that you know a lot of the information that you get now is spin it's straight from the company and it, I don't think that ultimately that serves any of us very well because journal, there aren't enough of us to do the work to make sure that what they're saying is true or not. Yeah, and I think that, that there's a real question about whether there will ever be enough of us again of the sort uh, a, a, in terms of what you would de define as traditional journalist. I mean, somebody paid by an entity that is uh, putatively independent in its outlook, and that's, whose sole objective is to meet the needs of its readers rather than having some other agenda. The Pointer Institute, uh, some people, at uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly, I forget her last name, I'm sorry. There's, there's a, a researcher at the Pointer Institute for Media Studies in Florida that is just completing with Tom Rosenstiel a new book on, the, on sort of rethinking the ethics of journalism. And one of the things uh, she's talk, talking about is the need to practice what she calls radical transparency. That, that the notion that we can expect all people doing what passes for journalism to be completely independent of all influence going forward is probably not realistic. And what's, what's probably at least critical uh, at a minimum is that they could be completely open and transparent about what interests they have if they have one. I would argue, and this is going to be, a, uh, I think, a sort of a radical statement, but, but I used to be a, a newspaper publisher, and I feel this way strongly. When we published the, the Advocate, I mean, we had to put out a newspaper that was appealing to the merchants of Williamstown and all of our advertisers all the way up here to Manchester. We couldn't put out a newspaper that was uh, socialist, radically socialist in its outlook, because it would, it would turn off people who we needed 
as advertising. So I, I don't think it's, I, I don't think it was ever the case uh, or is ever the case that journalists are entirely independent of all influence. I just think they need to be transparent about that influence. Now that's not, that in itself is a radical idea and I was surprised to hear Pointer, somebody from Pointer talking about it. But I'm curious what you guys think about it and also what those of you in the audience might think about it. Well, it might, one of my concerns is that is will the free market um, support the free press? Hmm. And it doesn't seem like it's being the case, and it, and it, and it talks directly what, what Bill was saying was, are people willing to, to pay for this kind of very large news organizations that are required to do the kind of um, um, editing and, and news gathering that, that we think is necessary? And maybe, maybe it isn't. Maybe the, the free enterprise system isn't going to work, and, and what Ann has hit on, and what uh, Vermont Public Radio has hit on, is that you need sort of a, um, a a different business model that that doesn't count on um, what um, the department store thinks or what well, the oil company thinks. Yeah, the the appeal that's made by public radio and by you, I'm sure, also is look at what we're doing as a public good. We we need this as a culture uh, and as a as a democracy, and so won't you help make sure that we all have that? I, I don't think local papers make the same pitch. Right. Well, and no, that's my point. Was that the, was that whether you're a profit making right. or a nonprofit organization, the story is the same. The best community-owned dailies that were published by uh, independent local publishers made that appeal in the quality of their news gathering. But that the, I mean that's one of the questions for tonight's. Yeah panel, which is, have journalists done enough to explain the role of news in society? And I think the answer to that question is no. Emphatically <laughs> you know? no. I yeah. mean, you know, we're our own yeah. worst enemies. You know, we're, we're, we're the last to often, you know, tutor our own horns about what we do because, um, in essence, we're just mirroring what society is. and. Um, and so it's not hero's work, but when it's gone, people notice. Right. What we've tended to do is, is believe that just by doing good work, it would be noticed and people would reward it uh, right. by their subscription or their donation. And I think that part of the problem we have now is media literacy is not as much an embedded practice. How to, how to, how to uh, understand and value information is not as taught as it was uh, but, 50 years ago. But, but I think there's also a tendency for journalists to glorify their own work. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's no reason for that. I mean, either it's useful or it's not. Right. And that's ultimately, you know, what matters. Is it useful? Is it giving people what they need? And, you know, again, we haven't helped ourselves in that regard. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there questions? Go ahead, sir. <laughs> we also know that he went out and bought a huge number of small local newspapers. So I'd be curious about your thoughts about why then he went he went that way. We know that he bought a railroad before that. And we <laughs> He is believes in the public good. Yeah, is there something <laughs> in that message that he's investing in all these papers that everybody's, you know, wondering if they're going to be there, and so he's got some notion about the future. Well, I, he sees something we don't. Well, don't you didn't know. see Warren Buffett buying newspapers when they were priced at a billion dollars for the Boston Globe. I think Warren Buffett is a very smart investor who is who is a value investor and also somebody who believes, you know, having spent his whole life in Omaha believes in the power of community and, and, and bringing a message that, that creates and, and solidifies community. So I think what happened is, is two lines converged. I mean, I think his, his interest in supporting community uh, crossed the line in the declining valuation of newspapers. And he just looked out and said, okay, where can I buy newspapers that are embedded in their community that, that Wall Street is now valuing at a price that if I buy it, I can get uh, a reasonable return on my investment five or ten years out. Because even because I think he did that, and because even if you think his the papers he bought, the Omaha World Herald, for example, 
even if that paper goes away in 15 or 20 years just because, as this gentleman said, print is going away, Warren Buffett will have long ago made his money back because he's a smart operator uh, and he buys low when he can. And he's buying something that has, in, in his view, super intrinsic value for at least some long period of time. And maybe by then he'll figure out how to turn the newsroom that puts out the print Omaha World Herald into something that's purely digital. He also, he also invests in traditional kind of industries, yeah. Can I get back to the Wall Street Journal just for a moment? And, uh, uh, yeah, and notwithstanding the political uh, editorials they've done, but the content of the paper itself, uh, it used to be a, five, uh, a paper that was printed uh, and published five days a week. And a few years ago, they came out with a Saturday edition. So your question for the camera is, with all of the smart sectioning that the Wall Street Journal does and their ability to deliver a paper on Saturday that has a late deadline the night before, is there a model that we can look at uh, for success there? Uh, I think that um, no matter what you think about Rupert Murdoch's politics or his meddling in politics, he, he, he uh, has done a, a good job of morphing the Wall Street Journal from a kind of iconoclastic business paper that did great, really incredible investigative journalism in, in investigating American business and how it's practiced to something that is more a general circulation newspaper that is fairly milquetoast in its business coverage now. So I think there are there's upsides and downsides to what he's done with the paper. But it, he certainly, I think, and he's also, I think, spent an enormous amount of money on it. Um, uh, because it's his flagship paper and everything that he's doing. But, so I think the business model there is, is if you invest heavily uh, and do a really good job editorially, it pays off. It's interesting, earlier, you know, I was reciting statistics about the decline of the newspaper industry. There's another very interesting experiment going on in the newspaper industry right now, and that is at the Orange County Register, where a 40-year-old guy named Aaron Kushner who actually uh, was in the greeting card business and lived in Wellesley, Massachusetts, went out and bought the dominant daily, but a very much shrinking daily, in the south of Los Angeles suburbs. He's doubled the newsroom to 360 people over the last year. Has, uh, I was just reading today that um, he's taking what was a twice a week insert into the Orange County Register covering uh, the city of uh, Irvine, which is right next door, and he's making it a five-day week, in week insert. So everybody in the industry is just watching him like a hawk, wondering if he will generate the increased advertising revenue and the increased circulation revenue to support that. So there are people like Rupert Murdoch, like Warren Buffett, like Aaron Kushner, who believe that newspapers are worth investing in and um, you know hopefully they'll be right in the long term because that's not what's happening at a lot of other news organizations and, and we're talking a lot about daily newspapers too but a lot of the specialty newspapers are, are doing quite well and even uh, seven days just increased their print run they call it circulation it's print run it's different the 36,000 which make it about the same size uh, print run as the free press, which of course is coming out in seven days, but um, every day. So there's specialty niche publications, print publications, there, there are examples of, of doing very well. They tend to be um, uh, alternative weeklies, although the Boston Phoenix just went out of business, right? So mm -hmm. it, 
that I'm sure that was the model for seven days uh, outside Boston. Uh, any, any other questions, sir? Yeah, I, uh, we all represent pretty much a traditional demographic of consumers of media. Uh, but the way in which the young, uh, you know, 30 somethings have changed in music publishing and how we saw the decline so rapid in terms of existing you know, CDs and, and in that industry, I'm interested to see how the, the young people today derive uh, their new. So your question they get, it, they get it from their friends. Yeah, yeah your question they is. They get their news from their friends. Yeah, for, for the camera, your question is where, are you, where is the younger demographic, let's say 18 to 34, which is the standard age bracket, where are they getting their news? The answer, it, Anne's answer is the best one, which is they're getting it from their friends. Through Facebook and Twitter. Uh, they're and also, all of us actually are trending to getting it off these now. Um, but that's through Facebook and Twitter. Right. Again. Uh, and most of them haven't subscribed to certainly and don't regularly read a newspaper. Uh, but they want the news recommended. They, they right. want to know someone else has looked at it. That's why things go viral. Just the way Google and these, and, you know, yeah. start seeing more and more uh, synchronicity with interactive media, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the global device and the distribution of media. Don't you think that the same way Google brings TV to people, Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a, it's tech, just as technology is changing so fast, so does the distribution and delivery of, of uh, electronic uh, mobile. So I'm sorry, mm -hmm. is this the question you're asking? Are you asking whether we think there'll be a different form in which the news will be delivered that will be somehow uh, different from the way it's delivered now? And well, you suggest that just the way Google is right. Well, it, it does exist. It exists through Google News. You know, if you get Google News and you have Google News for Vermont, that's your keyword, you'll get every story that is Which published stinks, around the by state. The way. It does stink, but that's one vehicle. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I say that not because it does, it, because, because it doesn't like give it, you it's, everything. It's yeah. because they do a very bad job at it. But that's you because do a, it's not, you, it's, they're not curating it, it's based on logarithms. Yeah, and but that's people, why if you're behind a paywall, you're not going to get picked up. Well, I'd like to learn how to do that, but that's another conversation. <laughs> you guys do it pretty well. <laughs> well, we need to do better at it. But, but, no, but Google, I think Google's doing a terrible job. And no, what they they're are. trying to do, they're doing a terrible job. But it, it's possible that that, that that could happen. The problem is that um, so many sites are behind a paywall now that you can't get a complete picture um, without... I mean, you can send people to the news site, right, to the Bennington Banner, or to... It's if you hit your five views, then you're not going to actually get in. And the thing that I find really frustrating with paywalls is that not I, I, I subscribe to the Times Argus and the Burlington Free Press. I don't have no problem paying the money. The problem is I keep track of 30 different passwords. Am I going to yes. remember that password when I go? I, you yeah. know, I'm not that smart. Like, forget about it. And it, it's to me, it's a barrier. Every time you put something up in front of someone where they can't get to where they want to go, they're like, oh, Shoot, I'm going to go like, get a cup of coffee, or yeah. I'm going to go to a different site. It's the hassle. And we're so impatient now as a society because we're used to the sort of instantaneous result thing. And anyway, yeah, but maybe someone could do it. But the paywall thing is a problem, really, I think. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That's what I'm wondering, because am I getting just 90 every morning? Yes. On an email. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. I can then click on any story. That's right. Yeah, that's right. 
Well, that's because you get so many per month and maybe your computer has tricked the New York Times. Well, you get the email every day. Yeah, That's but, probably because uh, the New York Times is sending you that email and they're putting a query string on the back of the URL that tells their computer to let you in because it was their email. But but that that's not but that's not that's not what she's asking. The other thing is if I were to go into just the New York Times. Right. Then each time I click on a story it comes up with one and they've got to pay for it. But if you well, I mean, Bill could be right. If you're actually clicking on the headline from the email to get to that story and a box doesn't come up, then they're, they're letting you in. But, it, but you're, you're getting the email because they want, you to, they want you to see that headline. They want you to See, the New York Times website. has a lot of different ways, that being one of them, to allow people to sample. Boy, see, they don't really work, do they, the paywalls? <laughs> well, it's not, that's why it's not right to call it a paywall. <laughs> um, you know, ca uh, calling, I'm, I'm struck uh, that it's all, it's sort of like when I was a kid, my mom had all these metal charge cards in her wallet for all the department stores where we grew up. Yeah, it's And then very Visa similar. and MasterCard came along. What you're right. saying is you want the Visa or MasterCard for content on the web. Um, I guess so. Yeah. I, I just don't want, I, I want them, to, I want a site to remember me without having to go through the hoopla of plugging in my password. Right. That's all. It's, yeah. I don't mind paying. Following up on the question John asked, I'm wondering, we see the guy at, at Dish TV, right? So he's got one of the two big satellite operations. He goes out and decides he's going to make a bid for Sprint. They say, if you've got this lucrative thing, why did he go and want to buy Sprint? Now, the conclusion I've come to is what John was saying, is if you can start getting TV, in effect, over your phone, then the whole cable model is going down the toilet, and it's mm -hmm. going down the toilet just like print has gone. Sure, through. absolutely. But if we go back to what you said, Bill, we got so many bucks we're spending, right? So if we used to spend 65 bucks a month for cable, and now we can get it on our phone. That money's going to become available. <laughs> or uh, Vermont Business News or Bennington because we've got targeted stuff that we want. Well, I think the reason that Comcast bought NBC was because they realized that they needed to be in the content business, not just the cable business, because the cable business has a half-life. Because I, I, don't, I think that in 10 mm -hmm. years, I mean, where we live in Williamstown, we have Time Warner cable. Uh, I virtually never watch television, which I think is kind of snobby and unusual. Most people watch television. Most people still get their news, by the way. More people still get their news from television than from any other source in this country. That's still the case, even today. Um, but um, uh, I, I suspect that in 10 years, most people will be, will be taking time Warner, not for the cable, but for the internet connectivity. Uh, so they've got to figure out a business model where they can up the ante for what they're getting uh, for their internet because the internet piece of Time Warner is $30 a month, okay? It's where they're making all the gravy is on the cable side. Well, if you don't want cable television anymore and you just want internet, they've got to come up some way to upsell above 30, right? So I think they're going to start saying, well, we'll offer you all these content packages on the web and we'll, we'll throw in Vermont Digger and we'll throw in the Bennington Banner and we'll throw in the Burlington Free Press and we'll throw in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Consumer Reports. All that for a nice monthly package would only be $20 a month. Would you take that deal? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it'll come. So I, 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 this has been a really engaging conversation and we should probably head out the door. I'd just like to one, add one more thing and that is that the, inter the internet has disrupted the journalism business, but that's just the beginning. I mean, think right. about retail, think about business, think about law, think about education. It's a, it's a wonderful tool that we all have, but it's gonna completely transform our economy and I think we have to be ready for that. Thank you so much for being such an engaging audience.